Thank you for having me here. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the necessity for urbanists, not architects or urban planners or geographers necessarily, but urbanists to harness emerging distributed technologies, not only to understand the operation of cities, but to promote behavior change, which can positively impact quality of life and sustainable practices. This is the realm of the Sensible City Lab at MIT, a multidisciplinary group of researchers at the intersection of architecture, urban planning, sociology, network analysis, and human-computer interaction that explores and addresses future relationships between people, cities, and new technologies. So, do you remember 1995? Well, just over a decade and a half ago, it now feels like the distant past. Mosaic had just appeared as the first internet browser. The internet was still in its infancy, still a secluded realm for adept geeks. But so great was the excitement about the digital world that some people believed we would soon be living virtual lives. Scholars speculated about the impact of the ongoing digital revolution on our cities. The mainstream view was that the death of distance, as enabled by digital media and the internet, would certainly cause the death of cities. Gilder proclaimed that cities are leftover baggage from the industrial era and concluded that we are headed for the death of cities due to the continued growth of personal computing, telecommunications, and distributed production. At the same time, Nicholas Negroponte wrote in Being Digital that the post-information age will remove the limitations of geography. Digital living will include less and less dependence upon being in a specific place at a specific time, and the tr transmission of place itself will start to become possible. So we all know that the story turned out quite differently, um, and it's a very hard job being a futurologist. In fact, cities have never prospered so much, and as has been shown in the past couple of decades, China itself is currently on the road to building more urban fabric than has ever been built by humanity. So the digital revolution did not end up killing our cities, but neither did it leave them unaffected. A layer of networked digital elements has blanketed our environment, thus lending our cities a new layer of functionality. These new digital elements allow us to extract and insert information almost anywhere in the city in real time. Thus, as urbanists, we comprehend built form and people, but additionally must recognize this new digital layer and that citizens and governments, as actuators of change in cities, are continuously mediating between both worlds and can and will utilize it to their and others' advantage, or in some cases, disadvantage. I'm going to be talking about three projects that um, we've been working on at the lab. Some of them are complete, some of them are still ongoing. Um, each of these show different representations of, of the city um, and use different techniques to do this. The first, Los Ojos del Mundo, um, uses a data scraping technique to get data from Flickr um, in order to show uh, movement and images in cities. The second, Trash Track, um, looks at our infrastructure and how we can start to map the invisible uh, infrastructures in our cities. And the third, the Copenhagen Wheel, is about how we can create objects that are smart, networked, that are in tune with our lives and can give us new access to new meanings in cities. So the world's eyes, or Los Ojos del Mundo, was conceived by one of our postdoctoral researchers who actually started looking at the idea of digital footprints. What is the information that we leave behind and how can this be used to construct an image of the city? Fabian realized that on the photo sharing website Flickr, people were uploading photos that contained a geo tag. That is a piece of metadata embedded in the photo that contains coordinates of where that photo was taken as well as a timestamp. At the same time, users of the service are also acknowledging where they come from, so which city they, what is their country of origin. Through a process of scraping data from Flickr um, and aggregating it to preserve anonym, anonymity, <laughs> Fabian was able to reconstruct temporal maps of places that were being visited and documented. Additionally, because of the information on the origin of the photographer, he was able to compare the image of the city as constructed by different groups of tourists and the image of the city held by locals. But this type of data scraping process not only has relevance for the understanding of images of the city that are created by different groups, when we zoom out to a regional or a country level, it is easy to, through this process to suddenly gain an understanding of tourism paths, for instance. The photo that you see on the, um, on the left is American tourists, which have a fairly standard elephant trail through Italy, and the travel patterns on the right are Italians. So this process of data scraping not only has relevance for these images, but um, is also, you know, the idea that it's temporal and it's a vital aspect of a new set of um, tools that urbanists must have. Here we see some finalized 
uh, videos of the project Ojos del Mundo, which maps geotagged photos from Flickr onto place and through time. These photos all have tags. As people upload their photos, they tag them with certain keywords. So these photos have the tag of party. But we can do similar things with groups of people. In the next video, you'll see, if we can start it. Here we go. In the next video, you'll see Britons who visited Spain during 2007. They stay on the beaten paths, and in a city like Barcelona, they are delimited by the main elements, such as Parkwell, Sagrada Familia, and La Rambla. Not surprisingly, the photos also confirm their pleasure for football, parties, and the Mediterranean Sea. Moving on to Trash Track. Here is where, you know, the, one, the lab is very multidisciplinary, and we take um, inspiration from a variety of sources. Here, the idea is that we have advances in microelectronics that are rapidly making it possible to spread smart dust, networks of tiny wireless microelectronical systems that are networked um, around our cities. In the future, we see that any, any object could be addressable. So taking this as an inspiration, we wondered, what would it be like to tag an object like trash and see what its final journey is? In other words, what is the removal chain rather than the supply chain? To do this, we created tags, and this is the second generation tag. Uh, the third generation is about the size of a SIM card, which conform to the solid waste disposal standards of the US and abroad, and which provide location information when attached to different types of trash as they make their way through the city's waste management system. I'm going to show a short video, and thank you to Armin Link for the video footage. Nobody wonders where each day the trash goes. Outside the city, surely, but each year the city expands. The bulk of the outflow increases and the piles rise higher. Become stratified, extend over a wider perimeter. So imagine we could use these smart tags. So what you're not seeing here is the final visualization of our 3,000 tags that we deployed in Seattle. Um, we asked 500 members of the public to come with their ordinary rubbish. We tagged the rubbish and then let them dispose of it in the way that they normally would. Then through processing this information and gathering it, we were able to visualize it and make it publicly accessible in real time. The idea was that we could understand the true hidden nature of an infrastructure like waste, waste removal. It can be highlighted and create a feedback loop, which is able to highlight um, inefficiencies in the systems. However, this feedback loop is not simply for the people to promote efficiency. Given that we're a multidisciplinary group, we're also concerned with promoting positive behavior change. If you knew that your Starbucks coffee cup was polluting your local waterways, would you still dispose of it in the same way? So the last project that I'll move on to is the Copenhagen Wheel. And this is a project that began with the mayor's office in Copenhagen. And they came to us because they have an incredible number of people to cycle. Uh, in fact, 36% of people cycle to work. But they're interested in increasing this number to 50%. And it's basically plateaued. They can't work out how to, how to improve that number. So we came to them and, and started brainstorming about the idea of using a small amount of technology on an everyday object like a bicycle in order to improve the cycling experience, encourage people to ride more, but also provide some useful information to the city and back to the citizens. I'm just going to show a short video, but let's hope this works. Welcome to the Copenhagen Wheel, the wheel that turns your ordinary bike into a smart electric hybrid, quickly and easily with no additional batteries or wires. The Copenhagen Wheel allows you to capture the energy dissipated while braking and cycling, and save it for when you need a bit of a boost. Controlled through your smartphone, the Copenhagen Wheel becomes a natural extension of your everyday life. The Copenhagen Wheel is your personal trainer, sensing your effort level and providing you with real-time feedback about your fitness and exercise goals. The Copenhagen Wheel also enhances your experience of the city. It connects you with things a cyclist wants to know. Upcoming traffic congestion, road conditions and pollution levels. Choose to keep your data or share it with your friends and other cyclists through social networks like Facebook. As you ride, you also collect green miles. It's similar to a frequent flyer program, but good for the environment. Elegant, responsive, smart. A new mode of transport for a rapidly changing world. 
So turn on your life and turn on the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. This is what we presented um, at the COP15 climate conference uh, to a number of mayors. And you might ask, you know, what is the relevance of, um, of an object to, to being an urbanist or, or to practicing urbanism in the city? And I think we're starting to see an age where we have many, many smart objects. And it's through the feedback loop, getting information from these and feeding it back to ourselves, that we're starting to understand how everybody can be part of this new urbanism. So this is just uh, showing the components of the wheel. Everything's packed into the back. It's easily retrofitable. Um, one other aspect that we were quite excited by was how we could seamlessly interact with this object. So we chose the platform of an iPhone, but obviously smart, any smartphone would work. And it's from there that you can actually ride the bike, so you can choose how much motor assist you would like, whether you're in regeneration mode, whether you're charging your batteries. But you also can analyze the data that your wheel is collecting. So the wheel is, has a number of sensors, carbon monoxide, NOx, sound, um, temperature, relative humidity, as well as an accelerometer. And all that time, you're gathering that data and feeding it to your phone. So you can analyze that data, which it's, it's here. You can see, you can analyze it, and then you can share that data as well with your friends in the city. So we were concerned that a natural approach would be to um, put something like an in-car navigation system on your bike. This is not what you want at all. I mean, we need to also think of these technologies in, as ambient, not as overpowering us in the city, but as something that gives us critical information when we need it, when it's appropriate. So, for instance, you might get a little ping that there's high carbon monoxide exposure. You're probably pretty much smart enough to, you know, choose a new route, route through the city and get back to where you need to go. At the same time, we have um, friend proximity, uh, calculations as well. We're trying to make some of these virtual Facebook networks a little physical in the city. How can we improve serendipity and have people meet up on the go? At the same time, it's analyzing health and the environment and the community. But the real power of this comes when people share their data. Cyclists can keep the data for personal use or share it with friends to gain access to a larger pool of information. They can also make a bigger contribution through their daily commute and share their data anonymously with their city. We see that when many cyclists donate the information collecting, the city gains access to a new scale of fine-grained environmental data information. Through this, cities can cross-analyze different types of environmental data on a scale that has never been achieved before, or build a more detailed understanding of the impact of transportation on a city's infrastructure, or study dynamic phenomena like urban heat islands. Ultimately, this type of crowdsourcing can influence how cities allocate their resources, how they respond to environmental conditions in real time, or how they, stru or how they structure and implement environmental and transportation policies. So what I've been trying to show through the projects just presented is that rich information can be captured and transmitted not only through ambient sensors and computers embedded in the urban environment, but through personal digital devices, such as mobile phones, people themselves can become probes, and they can report on what's happening around them by intelligently harnessing the power and bandwidth that they carry with them almost everywhere they go. As a result, our experience of urban spaces is transformed. It is no longer predominantly city designers and developers who give shape to our urban spaces, but almost anyone can participate in forming the digital layer of our environment. Thank you. <laughs>